morning. My name is Kelly Murphy, and I'd like to welcome you to Marshall Road Baptist Church. I'm so excited you've chosen to join us today as we gather to worship, learn, and share in the love of Jesus Christ. Here at Marshall Road Baptist Church, we're a vibrant and diverse community united by our faith in God and our love for one another, and that means your family. If you're visiting today, I just want to take a second and let you know about a couple of things. Number one, it's our Connect card. Located in the front of your seat, this card is your way to communicate to us and lets us know how we can help you take your next steps. If you happen to be joining us for the first time, please fill out that Connect card, turn it into the welcome desk where we have a special gift for you. This is just our way of saying that we're glad you're here. If you happen to be watching online, go to marshallroad.church, hit that Connect button. This is our online Connect card and lets us know that you're watching online today. Number two, be sure and download the Church Center app and choose Marshall Road Church when you log in. This is the center of everything we do here at Marshall Road. This app will help you do things like register for upcoming events, see what's on the calendar, view our ever-growing directory, and even give or donate with a click of a button. You can also find a ton more resources like our monthly newsletter. Speaking of which, a physical copy of this monthly newsletter can be found in the Connect Center. So be sure and stop and ask one of our Connect team members for a copy today. Because beyond our Sunday services, we're committed to making a positive impact in our community and the lives of those around us. So this is your one-stop shop to get all the information on what we're doing here at Marshall Road. So with all that, I just say thank you for being with us this morning. It's about that time we get to express our gratitude and devotion to God, to be inspired and encouraged in our faith journey. So join us as we worship and pour out our adoration this morning. Let's sing. Good morning, Marshall Road. Let's go and stand about to worship the king of the universe, the very one that gives us victory over death and sin through Jesus Christ. Found in you, found in you. Oh, 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 oh,
We are sons and daughters set free, and we are free indeed because of Christ. We are children of you, Father. We are heirs to the throne. God, I pray that in this next moment, as we continue in worship, that we would just rest in you, Father, that we would cast aside the stress of this week the things we did right or wrong, that we would just give it to you, Father. And that we would just lean back into you, God. Lean back into the arms that once you've got us, you'll never let go. Father, I love you. In Jesus' name. nor things present, 
nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. can see your love is better than all the others that I've seen I'm breathing deep all of your goodness your love and kindness to me now I can see understand that we would maybe get a, a small understanding of how grasp how how great your love is father help us to lean into you father may we be satisfied in your love We run around and chase so many things that might satisfy for a little bit. But God, we weren't created to be satisfied by those things. We we're created to be satisfied and to worship you. May we find that. Father, I pray as we move forward in our time of worship that you would bless the offering this morning. Make it sufficient to meet the need. Father, hide Roy behind the cross as he brings the message this morning. And may you be magnified in all of it. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
Amen. Well, good morning. You guys doing good this morning? Yes. Yes. You guys don't sound like you're doing very good. It's a beautiful day. Tammy's excited. The rest of you will get excited. I know you will. Well, as the offering plates come past, just remember this is a form of worship as we give back to our Father for the things that he's given to us um, out of an obedient heart. And truly, I think that's the challenge a long time is that obedient heart when it comes to giving. But so often when we act out of obedience, it's amazing to see what God does in each and every one of our lives. Amen? Amen. Amen. Well, a few things going on here at Marshall Road. The first one is just an update for you guys. The mission team took off on Friday morning at like, they had to leave for the airport at like 3.30 a.m. Now, how many of you are up that early? A few of you. All right. Just so you know, everyone on that team does not get up at 3 a.m. I don't even know if they get up at 7 a.m. Uh, so, and then they had a long day because majority of the day was flying. I think they landed late in the evening um, in the Dominican Republic. They kind of hit running, meeting with the church, having some fun. I heard there's dancing and there's some videos that we'll play when we get a hold of them. Um, but they've had a great time today. They're worshiping with the church out there. So they are full into ministry and serving. So continue to pray for them. They fly back um, this Thursday. They actually land at like 1130 p.m. So you know what it means what time they'll get back here? Like two in the morning. Man, those folks. But they'll have so much energy, we'll hear from them and they come back. So just continue to um, lift them up in your prayers. Also with that, we have our family nights coming up. Um, we have a movie night next Sunday. After that, we have the Travelers game, which you need to get your signups and money in for that um, today so we can order the tickets. And then we have a couple other things that are going on. Make sure you get the Church Center app so you can see what's taking place. You can sign up for everything right there, all in one place to make it easy and everything that way. And then with that... Um, Graduation time is now, so pray for the graduates. We'll see them next Sunday, but also camp. If you're going to student camp, there's a meeting after service right over here to discuss some things that are going on with that. Other than that, um, I'm sure there's lots of other things. Your baby bottles, don't forget them. Yes, Tim, what I forget? Men's shooting event next Saturday. It's going to be a blast. <laughs> Dang. Man. Sorry, I had to. Um, also, the following Saturday, women, you guys have a tea. It's a very unmarried birthday party tea thing to sign up for. That's going to be a blast. So there are some stuff going on. Sign up. It's going to be bla uh, a great time to fellowship with others and do fun things. All right? Um, that's all I have for right now. Let's go ahead and pray and get into the Word. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, truly we are thankful for what you have for us. We're thankful for your presence and to be your children, Lord. And Lord, we know that when it comes to being your children, we have to learn and we have to grow in areas that you would have us to be more like you. So Lord, we pray for our hearts, we pray for our minds as we get into the word and we see truly who you have each and every one of us to be in your family, Lord. Lord, we thank you for the work of the Holy Spirit that's going through each and every one of our lives, Lord, and just doing the work that he is doing. And we pray right now as we get into the message that we'd be distraction-free. I pray that I wouldn't be a distraction, but I pray that we'd be distraction-free so that our ears can hear the truth that you have for us, our heart can take it in and look and mold over it, and our mind can help us put it into action, Lord, this week as we live it out, being your children, Lord. Lord, again, I pray that I could be a vessel used by you and truly Pray that it be your words and not mine. And we just thank you for this time we could come together. And all God's people said, amen. amen, amen. All right. So real quick, turn to your neighbor and let them know Jesus loves them. Wow. All right. Is that how you share Jesus loves everybody? You guys are like, I have to do church with you guys, so, but you should already know it. Jesus loves you. Come on. I know you could tell them with enthusiasm that you were excited that Jesus loves you, so let them know that Jesus loves them. Come on. Let them know. <laughs> All right. 
Yes, we are working on it. And that's one of the great things about going through the book of Ephesians. Um, We're into it. We're week six into this series on Ephesians, finding out who you are in Christ. Before we jump into where we're at in chapter two, as we finish chapter two today, let's get us back up a little bit just to see where we've come from so far to set us up to where we're going today. In chapter one of Ephesians, Paul wrote to the Ephesus church and to believers, he began to outline the spiritual blessings we have in Christ. We looked at the wealth that's incredible, of the incredible things that he has for us that are ours in Christ. And many of the things, sadly, as even believers and those that go about their day-to-day walking with Christ don't fully experience or understand that are ours for the advantage of the taking. But yet, we've heard repeatedly from Paul phrases like, in Christ or in Jesus, We've heard talks about the spiritual blessings of being in Christ. We talked about how the things that are ours in Christ and what that means is truly what God has for us. And it's not just little things, it's great things that he has for each and every one of us that come in the form of spiritual blessings. Paul continues with that phrase as we went into chapter 2. In the passage we'll be looking at today, he's going to continue to carry these, the idea of just what we have in Christ. Paul began writing about our salvation and how our salvation comes by the fact that we are saved by grace and through faith. We talked about how important that was in the first part of Ephesians chapter 2, and it brings balance to our understanding that we're saved, but yet there's still a war that wages within us, and that war that keeps going on, but we have to die to self. And he tells us one of the great things is when we come to Christ. We come to God. It's not about anything that we have done, but truly about what he has done for us. Meaning it's not about our works or a term that we would use nowadays, our legalism, catching those steps and doing just the right things, but truly what Paul emphasized in chapter 2 reminds us that you and I are not saved by anything we've done. No, we're saved by God's grace. Not following rules, not checking boxes, but saved by God's grace grace. And the great thing about that grace is it's a free gift that Paul emphasizes that is given to each and every one of us. The question is, do we accept the gift? And not simply accept the gift and taking it, but opening up, seeing what it has, and taking out and using just those things that we talked about over the last few weeks. Now, you guys know that I don't make a practice of assuming for good reasons, especially when it comes to people and their salvation, because we've had talks with folks, right? And you know how those talks go sometimes where they throw out just the right terms, and you can walk away and you're like, I think they're saved. But then as you walk further enough away, that voice hits you in the back of the head, but are they? To where you sit there and go, I don't know, that's a good question. Should I ask more? No, it'll be okay. They answered all the questions, right? The thing is, I never want to assume where someone is spiritually. Never want to assume that anyone even in this room or that's watching online at a later time, that they've received the gift of Jesus. I would tell you this, if you have questions and you're not quite sure, ask your questions. And be encouraged to listen to the message and as we go through this and even talk to others in the room or find someone that you can speak to and just understand the truth that God has for you. That truth of the gospel, the good news And ask the questions so that you can know truly, are you saved? Will you be with Christ in eternity or not? Because I'll tell you the truth, to say not is not a good thing. But to say yes and to know is an amazing thing for each and every one of us, not only in this life, but in our life to come. Well, as we enter into the second half here of chapter 2, Paul continues to write about the Gentiles and the Jews, and this kind of separation that takes place between the two of them. Paul painted a pretty drier picture as we looked at it last week about the Gentiles and how the Jews viewed them, and also the standoff between the Gentiles' view of the Jews. And to say that most of it, as we're going to see today, there was a, what you could call a wall of hostility between the two sides. And the crazy thing is, as much as that was there, and we looked at it, Last week, when we hit verse 13, he talked about how lost the Gentiles were, how they were cut off, how they were without hope, 
and without a God in their lives. But he ended, verse 13, last week where Paul says, but God brought them close. What a wonderful verse. Notice it doesn't say that they came or we come to God. It says, he brought us close to him. And that is a beautiful thing for each and every one of us because it is God who is coming to us. This is the greatest news that you and I could ever have as Gentiles. And that picture is painted, though, that as much as God came to the Gentiles and he came to the Jews, there's still that kind of war that took place between the two sides. They couldn't quite yet still come together. And though... We came from a place of hopelessness and godliness, godlessness. Yes. There is something greater by what we have in Christ. The title of today's message is New in Christ. We're going to continue out the end of chapter 2, looking at verses 13 through 22. And as we get into this, we've covered last week. We're going to pick up right at verse 14 and going forward. But I would ask if you'd bear with me as we read. I want to read verses 11 through 22. And I want to read the entirety of it for continuity's sake, but also so we can see the full picture that we've been looking at, all right? So Ephesians chapter 2, picking up in verse 11, says, Therefore remember that you once Gentiles in the flesh, who were called uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, made in the flesh by hands, that at the time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenant of the promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But, it says in verse 13, now in Christ Jesus, you were once far off, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. And then we pick up our passage today in verse 14. It says, for he himself is our peace, who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation having abolished in his flesh the enmity that is the law of the commandments contained in ordinances so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace, and that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off and to those who were near. For Through him, we both have access by one spirit to the Father. Continues in verse 19, it says, Now therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and the members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place in God of God in the Spirit. And we stop there today. Our passage today, we see some things concerning the Jews and the Gentiles and truly God's family. Now, how many of you have traditions in your family? Revolving around vacation, maybe, and the planning, the things you take of it, maybe even your Christmas or holidays and how you get together as a family. How many of you had the joy when you first got married trying to figure out which traditions you were going to hold to? Oh, so much fun, right? The best part's whenever you got to go, you know, we want to make our own new traditions. And you got that look, right? You do, huh? We'll see how that goes. And it was fine the first couple years before you had kids. But when the kids came along, guess what? Now it was really time to forge those new traditions. Well, what we're going to see today, before anything can go forward, our first point is breaking traditions. The feud between the Jews and the Gentiles, or as the Jews called the Gentiles uncircumcised people, was ill-received by the Gentiles, who were aware of their attitude towards them. And the result of this really did, as the scripture tells us, build a wall of hostility between the two groups. And that was difficult because they were supposed to be what? One family. But it wasn't working out. There was still that result between them. Crazy side note for you, just because I want to squirrel for a moment. In Israel, the temple's built, and it's going on in the first century. And as the Gentiles were coming to the temple, 
and the Jews were coming to the temple, literally they had their places to go. You see, there was the Gentile courtyard that the Gentiles could go to, and that's as far as they could go. But then there was the area that the Jews could go into that literally separated them by a wall. There was a physical wall of separation between the two so that neither could go across their sides for worship. They legitimately were divided. But verse 13 says, But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. And I like how it continues into verse 14. For he, being Jesus himself, is our peace, who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation. The text gives us this picture that there was those that were far off, which we know to be the Gentiles, right? And then there was those that were brought near, which were the Jews, but at the same point in time, God's work in the ministry that's taking place, you now have Gentiles coming near to God. But yet there was a problem between that new group that couldn't get them along. And think about it from the point of the first century Jews, if you could, for a minute. They'd been raised to believe that the Gentiles were godless. And they were right in that because if the Gentiles grew and become a group, truly they had no foundation. They had no God like Israel did. They were godless. They were hopeless. But yet things were changing for them. They were coming to Christ. And they were coming in waves to Christ. And it was starting to cause a war amongst the new family. Now, a little other crazy side note, because I want to squirrel for a minute again. We talked about Abraham last week, right? And Abraham was the father of the nation. Do you guys know that Abraham wasn't a Jew? Yeah, he wasn't. He wasn't a Jew. Did you know in the scripture it tells us that he came from Ur of the Chaldeans? If you don't know about Ur of the Chaldeans, they were basically homed in Babylon, which means that Abraham was a Gentile that God called out of his home and told him to what? Go to the land that I will show you. And along the journey, Abraham goes through some different things. He has two sons, right? He has Ishmael and he has Isaac. And God tells him out of Isaac will become the nation Israel. And out of Ishmael became the rest, the Gentiles, who were already on earth. But God called Abraham, an uncircumcised pagan, a Gentile, out of his land. And as a result of that, Abraham was faithful to God, Scripture says. And God made a covenant with him that he would bless his people. And in doing so, there were some things that we talked about in that covenant, right, that would take place. And then as a result of that became the circumcision that would mark a difference in God's people. But what we see in Abraham and the Jewish people to understand is that God saved by grace through faith. Abraham just as he saves each and every one of us today and has been doing. First century, they're seeing this movement come up. The Jews are now seeing the Gentiles be saved. Pentecost happens and many Jews come to faith. And after that, they're starting to see the Gentiles come and they're watching this take place. And the crazy thing was, as much as the Jews had this dishatred for the Samaritans, remember them? They were the half-breeds. They really had a hatred towards the Gentiles, and they were having a hard time grasping the concept that they were accepted into God's family just like them. So this is taking place, and then it says there in verse 14, he himself being Jesus is our peace. Our peace. Jesus is for both the Jews and the Gentiles. And in going to the cross, it says that he breaks down the wall of hostility between the two meaning that Christ's death, he removed the obvious barrier that made it separate Jew and Gentile alike, and he gave access to God to both, a spiritual unity. And you're probably thinking, well, how did he do that? Well, I'm glad you asked that for us. There's three ways in which our, we have access to God. And the first is that he, Jesus, abolished the law. It's important to understand and we look back from our study over in, um, we did look at the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5, verse 17. Jesus said 
Do not think I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Jesus came to fulfill that law. And in doing that fulfillment, he broke and abolished the law. And what I mean by that is actually more or less the moral law, the ceremonial law that the Jews had, the many different steps that they had for cleansing and washing and the different things that they went about in those 613 other rules. Can you guys handle the Ten Commandments? Add 613 onto that and see how it goes. That he abolished. The ceremonial laws, the requirements, those things are what he fulfilled. The gospel tells us that Paul wrote for us here in Ephesians, for by grace you have been saved through faith, not of yourself, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. And why is that? We all know what we would do if it was us telling people about God and it was our works, right? Well, you're not going to believe what I did in order to progress, um, impress God and why he accepted me into his family. How do you think that's going to go over with other people? Oh, wow, good for you, huh? Nice job. But when we sit there, we can't explain it because it is God's gift. All we can sit back and go is, man, I can't believe what God did for me. And people are like, what do you mean? Well, this is who I was, and this is where he's brought me to. And this is what I get as a result of all that. And I did nothing for it. Talk about the best gift ever. So Christ abolished the impossible ceremonial code. Second, Jesus created a new humanity. And read verse 15 again with me, and it says, so as to create in himself one man from the two. See, Jesus didn't sit there and say, okay, I'm going to Christianize the Jews, and I'm going to Judaize the Gentiles, nor did he make some half-breed like the Samaritans that we already had. He said, no, it's a new man. And in an entirely new group of people, as Ephesians 2.10 tells us, we are his workmanship created in Christ. We are God's masterpiece, a new race in Jesus Christ. Now, this shouldn't be watered down as we often do, like, oh yeah, you know, I'm one of God's kids, but I still do my thing. No, no, no. We are God's children. We are with him, which when that comes to the place, it means that we're no longer alienated. We're no longer set apart. There's no prejudices that are hated or estrangement between the group. We are found in one fellowship of love throughout the whole earth. God, Jesus created a new humanity. With breaking down of that wall of destruction, the last thing that we have that access to God is because Jesus reconciled the new humanity to God. Follows in verse 16, it says, he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the hostility. Jesus, when he went to the cross, he ended the war between believers. No longer giving us that way to sit there and go, well, I don't like you and I don't like you, but I'm going to do my thing. He brought us as one body, one group to worship and to come together. And the reality of the hearts of the church where Christ truly reigns, that is what he brought so that we could have communion with God and have a life with him. All this builds upon Christ's ministry of peace and reconciliation found in verses 17 and 18 that we read when it said, and he came and preached peace to you who were afar off and those who were near. So it's for all, right? For through him, we both have access by one spirit to the Father. Isaiah prophesied about this preach being preached, peace, peace to those far and near in Isaiah chapter 57. And if we look back to even the night when Christ came, what did the angels say to the shepherds on the hillside that day? In Luke chapter 2, verse 14, glory to God in the highest on earth, peace to those with whom he is pleased. Christ came to give us peace. And he reconciled the way for us in doing so. He truly is our peace. We have so much because of what Christ did for us. Paul continues in the passage, and he talks about the members of the Trinity again in verse 18, with God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. 
And he relays the message that God the Son, Jesus, made the access possible by destroying the barrier between man and God. And to understand this for a moment, when it came to the Jews going into the temple, they could only go in so far. And the priests could go in further, but then there was that day of atonement, which they had to go past the barrier, the curtain that was hung, and only one of the guys could do that. And when he did, they even knew what they did. The problem was, they were afraid he might die on the other side. So you know what they did? They tied bells around his waist with a rope around him. They were actually smart, because I wonder how many times it took him with some. No, I'm just... So if the bell stopped going, guess what they could do? Drag him out. But when Christ was on the cross, when he said it was finished, in that final moment, the veil was torn that allowed access for both Jew and Gentile to the Father because of our high priest, Jesus Christ. We'll stop for a minute here. And to consider what we've seen so far, so what question? And this is the question to make us think. And the question is this. Do I have Christ peace? Do you have Christ peace? This is probably, if you were to ask someone and ask most people, the number one response to what would you like in life besides money would be peace. And we know this to be true because every Miss America pageant, when they come out and they ask the contestant what they want, what do they say? World peace, which is amazing. They've been asking for world peace for so many years, but yet... We can have peace. So I'm going to ask you a question. When I say, do you you have Christ's peace, I'm going to follow it up with this question. Do you have any conflict with other believers right now? I know what you're going to tell me. Roy, we're not going to discuss that right now. I got a lot going on. I got things that I'm dealing with. And though truly I would like to be at peace, I don't want to discuss that right now. Can I be Captain Obvious for a moment with you on this? We want peace, but yet we're at war with others. Not always good, right? And if we think about it, here's the obvious for us. Christ gives his followers peace with God, taking away the penalty and the burden of sin that once separate us from our creator. We get that from Christ, or from God, because of Christ. Here's another obvious Christ gives us peace within ourselves, offering us rest for our souls from the cares and worries of life and strength to endure its trials. When we come to Christ, we get this as well. Another one, just to point the obvious out, because sometimes we miss it. Christ gives us peace with each other, tearing down the walls that once kept us apart in self-centered isolation and rivalry. I'm going to state the obvious. This peace in our life is because of the forgiveness and the reconciliation that we have as believers as a result of the blood of Christ on the cross, which brings healing and peace for us. But yet when you find yourself at odds with other believers, we don't have Christ's peace in our life. We have that bitterness We have that anger. We have that resentment. We have the problems, all because we don't want to talk about it. We'll say, I'll talk about it when I'm ready. But yet at the same point in time, it's that thing that always gets pushed off. And it's that same point we always sit there and we keep questioning, well, why am I not at peace? Why am I not able to go forward with this? It's because we haven't sought the forgiveness and the reconciliation that we need, which understand this. At first, it's between you and God. And when you and God get things worked out and that amazingness, guess what? Then you can have a conversation with your brother and sister that's not going to interrupt into a war with the first words out of your mouth. And if both parties, amazing that that would be, right, went to God first, think about the conversation that would take place between the two. It wouldn't be a war room kind of setting, it would be a legitimate peace talk. And reconciliation would happen between the two. And all we simply have to do to start the process is repent of our sins, put our faith in Jesus Christ, and we would see the peace and unity in our relationships around us. All because 
of the Prince of Peace, who we've accepted into our lives. Having peace with God will make a more peaceful conversation with your brother and sister and truly put us at a point where we could be, guess what, at peace. And we could be in Christ peace. Is that not an amazing place to be? And it always makes me wonder, if we could do that within just, say, the walls here of this church, how much greater could that be with the walls of the other churches all around us? as we strive for what God would have each and every one of us to do. I don't know, just saying, there's the obvious for you. So we saw breaking tradition, now we're going to transition to building new, because after we break something, we got to create something, do we not? And something new has to come from it. So since grace means no one's efforts can make them acceptable to God's salvation, which means everyone, Jew and Gentile, slave or free, male or female, everyone needs the gift of Jesus. It also tells us that we have the same equal access to God as we have learned in the passage here, which means that we're all considered equal in heaven, which is going to be a great party when we get there. And the amazing part when we get there is going to be, I'm here because of what God did for me. Not because of what I did for Roy, because most people are going to be like, you're here? Wow. Wait a minute. You did what again? No way. And then the more amazing part is going to be those people that we led to Christ that we didn't quite know. When they come up and go, I'm so excited to see you because then we're going to be like, you're here? Wow. This is a cool place. But what it does is bring us together as a family. And it shows that truly we are one. We are equal in that thing and having that access to God. And truly it's something that kind of stumbles us at times because oftentimes, and we do it, we either think because a person's older or mature that they've been with Christ longer, which is not always the case. They may have came to Christ later in their life. Or just because of where they were and what they did, they were closer to God. But know this, we all have the same access to God. It's not like there's a special phone in my office that gives me a direct line to God. It's not the case. I have the same access as each and every one of you. We all have the same access to God. So Paul here, though, changes up metaphors. And the way that he's talking, and a metaphor is kind of like how he's connecting the picture. And he uses the terminology for this new building as calling us citizens, saying that we are citizens or members of God's family. And to be honest with you, becoming a citizen of God's family is a lot easier than becoming an American citizen. Has anyone went through that process? It's not easy. I'm just going to tell you that right now, okay? To come to God's family, though, there is a simple process, and Paul defines it for us pretty clear, as well as could cause confusion, but the steps are simple for us. It's found in Romans chapter 10, verses 9 through 10, and it says, if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. One believes with the heart, resulting in righteousness, and one confesses with the mouth, resulting in salvation. The steps are simple to become one of God's citizens, and if you follow the steps, guess what? Bam, you're a card-carrying member of God's family. The problem is we don't always follow the steps in the right order. But when we follow the steps, believe in our heart, and confess with our mouth, oh, what a great day. And guess what? I forgot to mention it. There's no language test. To become an American citizen, you got to be able to speak English. We all know how hard it is to speak English. I can't even get it right. That or it's just my ADHD. I don't know. So this new family is not made up of simply Jews or simply Gentiles. It's not a crossbreed between the two. But as Paul says, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens to the saints and members of the household of God. Paul refers to believers, which are Gentiles and Jews. Those with bad backgrounds and those with questionable backgrounds are all the same. No one is a second-rate citizen because they were a Gentile and not a Jew. We are all one in the family. And in God's kingdom, we all have full citizenship, which means we get all the benefits together of God. 
We are a new creation, as Scripture tells us, a new person. Some would refer to this as being a new race or the third race. But truly, we are one because we are God's children. And Paul describes in the text that we are members of God's household. And we're in this great relationship with each other. And Paul encouraged Timothy in the same way with the relationship of believers in 1 Timothy 5, verses 1 through 2, when he says, Don't rebuke an older man, but exhort him as a father, younger men as brothers, older women as mothers, and younger women as sisters. So what are we truly to be? A family. And we are a family that's blended together, and wisdom comes in many shapes and forms, but yet we're all one in Christ. Which I know goes to the question that always gets disputed about, should we refer to each other as brothers and sisters, and where does that put each person, because do we know where they are? Let's let God worry about that. But when we come together, we can be brothers, we can be sisters, and we can do great and amazing things with him. The horizontal relationship implications of our being in God's family are beautiful, and as Paul is trying to get us to understand just this new family, he changes metaphors here in the description of what he's describing. He goes from citizenship to talking in construction terms to understand the building that's going on here. And he changes it when he says Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. If you didn't know, a cornerstone means the tip of an angle, which is the perfect angle that the building is going to be built upon. It also refers to the capstone or the binding stone that holds the whole structure together. When you have a cornerstone for the foundation, it's the first one that's laid. And it's perfect in all shapes and angles. And everything that's built upon that should be laid what? Perfectly down. And with Christ as our cornerstone, he sets the foundation upon which we build our lives upon. Everything else just slides smoothly into place. And if we keep with the common foundation and we build upon what God has for his people, truly, it's a beautiful building that is being built. It says in the passage, it's a holy temple where God dwells in beauty and glory. So when it comes to the church, we should see the church is a beautiful, is a building, perfectly designed by the greatest architect that could ever be. It's not haphazardly a pile of stones that's thrown into a field that just comes together out of randomness. No, it's created and arranged by God, putting all the pieces in to the perfect spot. Much like when you follow those Lego instructions, the right way, and not try to guess on your own, everything fits in perfectly, locking together. God arranges the church for his glory and for his purpose. In this too, we see the church is a dwelling place a place where God lives. It's never to be an empty house that is a vital or a museum to be on showcase, but truly a place to come where we see God ministering and doing a work in the lives of those that are in the building. The church should be both a living place for God and his people. And then thirdly, we see the church is a temple, holy and set apart to God. We serve there as the folks, the priests, the leaders, and the different aspects of the things that we do as we go forward, truly not in lip service, but in holy service with our hearts praising God. I don't know about you, but it paints a beautiful picture as you can see that the church is this amazing place put together. And while God will see it in its full form of glory, we kind of sit back sometimes and go, so why do you put that piece there? How come I'm here and not over there? And, you know, it'd be really nice if um, that wasn't there and there was this instead. But guess what? That's not what God has in plan. God is working to set up a beautiful place for each and every one of us to come together and worship and be as one family with him. So what? We pause for a minute again to reflect And the question for us here is, do I understand what I have in God's family? Oftentimes, we kind of forget just what we have, which was Paul's reason for writing Ephesians to remind the believers who they were in Christ, because we have spiritual amnesia sometimes. And it's this thing where we sit there and go through life, 
We know we're gods and we know we're part of the family, but then all of a sudden something happens and we start to act afoot. And what do we do? We go to our old ways. And we have to be reminded of who we are in Christ. Paul returns to the thought which led to the discussion of the church being built here. He says, in whom you also are being built together for a habitation of God in the Spirit, in verse 22. He's taking formal outcast. He's taking the people that were near and far and brought them to him. God has his presence with us. And he's putting together a place that truly can have all the benefits of Christ as we gather together. Which reminds me of the words of Revelation that come to mind here in Revelation 21, verse 3, that says, Then I heard a loud voice from the throne. Look, God's dwelling is with humanity, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them, and they will, and they will be with their God. Truly, that's what God would have for us. Peter had similar words when he shared for us and encouraged us in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5, when he said, you yourself as living stones, get that? You guys are living stones, which means you can't be what? Deadbeat stones, okay? Living stones, a spiritual house, are being built to be a holy priesthood. And the crazy thing is we work through it and we remember just who we are in Christ and understanding what God has for us. We are his children. And the crazy thing is, is yes, right now we kind of have some weird division amongst us. We all meet in different places and different things. Know this, that same war was taking place when Christ walked the earth between the Jews and the Samaritans. And I think of Jesus' words in John chapter 4, verse 21. It says, believe me, woman, an hour is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. Which means for us, you know what we will worship the Savior? In heaven together. And it's going to be a great and glorious time. The fact that we can be as one, a living stone, worshiping our Father. Amen? Amen. Would you bow your heads with me? Dear Heavenly Father, oh, what a great joy to be in your house. Oh, what a great joy to be in your family. To be with you. Lord, I pray for my brothers and sisters right now as we enter into this time of reflection, but a time of choosing what we do in our life, Lord, a response. And while some of us may be walking on the path, some of us may be standing near the path, and some of us may be wondering about the path, I pray right now that you would speak to each and every one of us. I pray in this message that we would see the benefits of being in your family and to step onto the path again or to even join the path. I pray for those that are on the path that you would give them the strength and encouragement to go the direction that you have for each and every one of them, Lord. So Lord, right now during this time, the music will play, we'll sing the song, but I pray that we would respond to you and what you would have. And all God's people said, amen. And with that, if you need prayer during this time, you can come forward. Otherwise, you can stand, you can sit, you can kneel if need be, but respond to what God is speaking to you. For my waking breath, for my day breath, I depend on you, I depend on you for the sun to rise, for my sleep at I depend on you, I depend on you, you're the way, the truth, and the life, you're the well that never runs dry, I'm the branch and you are the vine, draw me close and teach me to Where the Spirit leads, 
Truly, our prayer is that we would draw close to you. We would abide in you for all that you have, and that we would take in just what you have for each and every one of us. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Real quick, I have an announcement. Two, actually. One, I want to um, have you guys welcome some new folks that joined Marshall Road. The first is the Clarks in the back right back there. They're shy, so if you want to shake their hand, you're going to have to get with them. <laughs> and then the second person, who is really shy and probably going to hide underneath her chair right now, is Miss Sally right here. Yeah. So <laughs> encourage them, strengthen them, be with them. They're part of the family at MRBC, which is great news. Otherwise, you guys have an opportunity to go out with dancing. But before that, just a reminder, if you're a parent and a student for camp, meet over here once we're done and we'll talk. Otherwise, let's go out dancing. <laughs> 